baby on the deals, Nick. Okay, so today's class, we're going to talk about logging. As I said, this is this week, sort of the last week of what you need to, to the basics of building a, a, a single node database system. So if you understand today, today's topic, we understand Wednesday's topic, then that's everything you need to build a full database management system running on a single machine uh, that's you know fault tolerant, um, can recover after crashes, and can do transactions. So today's class, we'll talk about logging schemes of how to actually write data out to a log. Uh, while we're running running transactions in order to recover after a crash. Um, before we jump into that, the, the we're nearing the end of the semester, um, so there's only a couple more deadlines coming uh, that you have. So homework four is due today at midnight. Project three is due next week, next Monday at midnight before the holiday. And then homework five will go out next week, and that'll be due December third. And then I'm missing project four, but project four will be due, I think, at, at the end of uh, the end of the semester. I think before finals week. And then the extra credit is due around that time as well. Okay? So we're almost done. We're almost there. So I want to start off today's lecture with a sort of a, a simple motivating example to help us sort of set us up to understand why we're going to talk about what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to run a simple transaction that's going to do a read on A, write on A. And then we want to see now, actually physically, where the changes that we're, this transaction is making is actually going to end up. So we start, transaction starts off, there's nothing in our buffer pool, and it wants to do a read on A. And out on disk, we have a single page, and that page has one record, A. And so in order to read this, this record, we have to go copy it from the, 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 the page on disk and bring it into our buffer pool. Right? And we know how to do this because we covered this before. So now once it's in memory, now we can do, uh, do a write on it. So now we do a write on A, and again, the, the way database systems work, or just sort of storage works in, 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 in real systems, I can't modify things directly on disk. I want to modify the, 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 the object in memory first. Right? So we can write, make our write to our, our buffer pool. So then now our transaction is going to go commit. Right? And again, commit would basically mean, is going to want to, we want to say is that the, the database system is going to, going to give an acknowledgment to the outside world that our transaction is, is durable, is safe, right? Meaning all the changes that it, that it made are, be, are persisted out the disk. So at this point here, do we want to tell the outside world that, that we've committed our transaction? Yes or no? What's that? A2 is not yet. Correct. So he says, he says no, because A2 is not in, 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 out on disk. Right? Because what could happen is we could have the the, you know, the most evil person in the world, right, the Hitler of databases, Hitler, he comes along and he zaps our machine, we lose all power, and our write goes away. So if we had told the outside world that our transaction has committed, then Hitler comes along and kills us, then we're screwed because now anybody comes back and is going to want to look to see, oh, I know I just, you told me this transaction committed, I know I made this change at A, where is it? Right, and we can't recover it. So that's what we're talking about for this week, crash recovery. And recovery algorithms, the basic idea is there are going to be the techniques we're going to implement inside of our database system that's going to allow it to ensure that it can guarantee consistency, uh, consistency, atomicity, and durability despite any or almost any possible failure that the database system may incur. So every recovery algorithm is going to have two parts. The first part is going to be the actions that the, that the database system takes at runtime as transactions are modifying the database. And then the second part are the, are the methods or techniques we use after a crash or after a restart. Or how do we use the information that we uh, generated during runtime, during the first part, to restore the database to the correct state? Right? We, we want to guarantee uh, that all our transactions are ACID. Right? So atomicity, consistency, and durability. Isolation is, is about concurrent control, how to interleave the operations. We're not so much worried about that here. So for this lecture, we're focused on the first part. Right, today, we're going to talk about the runtime things, what you actually need to do while you're running transactions, what information you want to generate, write it out the disk, so that if there's a crash, you can come back and restore the, the, the database to the correct state. So we're going to talk about a bunch of different things. So we'll start off talking about the, the, uh, sort of the different types of failures that we could, we could incur in our database system and that we want to overcome uh, in our recovery protocol or recovery algorithm. Then we need to talk about the management policies for our buffer pool manager. 
for deciding how data is, is when data is actually written out the disk and when you're allowed to do this. Then we'll talk about two techniques to do recovery, uh, the runtime recovery mechanisms. I'll we'll talk about shadow paging, and we'll talk about write ahead logging. And then we'll the orders flipped, which we'll talk about logging schemes next, and we'll finish up talking about checkpoints. And the checkpoints will segue into what we'll talk about on Wednesday, of actually how do you take the information we've collected today in our system and be able to re restore the database to the correct state. OK? All right, so the recovery mechanisms that we're going to have in our database system um, are going to target the different components that we're going to have uh, in our architecture. And those components, in some ways, their failure models are dependent on the underlying storage device that they're predicated on, or where they're actually storing data. And so for these different storage devices, since they're going to have different properties of durability, then we're going to want to have different, different policies of how we actually treat them, how we actually put data into them. So the first thing we need to do is understand a bit more concretely what the storage devices are, and then we can see what the failures we could have on those possible storage devices. So this basic hierarchy we've already talked about before at the beginning of the class. Right? We have the, the, this dichotomy between volatile storage and non-volatile storage. So volatile storage is DRAM. Right? This is not, uh, it's not persisted after a restart, after a crash. Right? Because the way DRAM works is the, 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 you know, the motherboard is, is, is giving it a small amount of charge every so often. And that's how it's restoring the, the charge inside of it to maintain ones and zeros. So obviously, if you lose power to DRAM, your, the, the, the charge dissipates and you lose your data. Right, there's been studies that think it maintains the data under the right conditions for maybe like 20 seconds after you lose power. But again, that's not, that's not good enough for, for what we need in our system. Then the, the, so the next category is non-volatile storage. And this is what we've been assuming, what, what, what we've been calling the disk throughout the entire lecture. Right? This is your spinning disk hard drive. This is your SSD. And the key difference about non-volatile storage and volatile storage is that any write we do to non-volatile storage will, will be retained after we lose power. There's a whole bunch of other stuff we talked about earlier about uh, non-volatile storage is usually doing writes, reads and writes at a page or block level, and they're better for sequential, sequential access rather than random access. Right? All those properties still, still matter here, and we'll see how we design algorithms to take advantage of that in a second. The last type of storage is, uh, in our classification is called stable storage. And so this would be a type of non-volatile storage that can survive any possible failure, failure model we throw at it. So I say it's non-existent because if I have a you know, SSD and I light it on fire and I melt it, right, I lose all my data. Like, there's no magical device that's going to be able to per persist no matter you know, if I shoot, shoot it with a gun or blow it up in a bomb. right? There's, this doesn't actually exist. But this is actually where we're going to end up storing our log when we talk about write-ahead logging because we never want to lose data from this because we never want to lose uh, the log, and we always want to put in stable storage. So the way you essentially get stable storage is you can approximate it through redundancy, right? Through like RAID, having replicas, or doing offsite replication to another machine or another another data center. You can basically approximate this to, uh, to get stable storage, but you can't buy you know you can't buy a single device that, that gives you this property. All right. So now, given these uh, storage types, now we talk about the classification of different type of failures we can, we're going to encounter in our database system. And we're going to see as we go along, we can talk about for the, dif the different runtime protocols, like shadow paging versus write ahead logging, which one of these are resilient or able to overcome these different types of failures. So the first type is going to be transaction failures. So these are going to be things that the, that the transaction is going to get tripped up on that the database system is going to prevent it from actually continuing and, and committing. Right? So there's logical errors, things if I violate integrity constraints, like I can't you can't uh, insert a record with a, uh, with a duplicate key as, a, as, as another, another record. Right? These are things that the database system will say, you can't do this. You have to abort. And you have to roll back your changes. The second one are internal state uh, mechanisms of the database system to, to prevent transactions from continuing because they're violating some higher level concept like serializable ordering. So this is like the deadlock detection or deadlock prevention stuff you're implementing in the, in the third project. Right, so both these cases, you know, these are, these are going to be very common, and we want our recovery mechanisms to be able to handle both of these. Right? In these cases, we don't want partial transactions. We don't, any transaction that gets tripped up on these two types of errors, we want to make sure we roll back all of their changes. The next are system failures. 
Uh, so this would be hardware and software. So a software st system failure would be there's a bug in our database system. Right? Somewhere we have an uncaught exception on a divide by zero, and the, you know, we, we, the OS crashes us. Right? We, don't, we don't want th this to happen, obviously, and database vendors spend a lot of time testing the database system as much as possible to make sure they catch all bugs, but you know, no software is magically bug-free. So this can occur. So again, if, if we have a software failure and we have a transaction running, we want to make sure we don't come back and still see the changes from that transaction. Hardware failures are when the actual machine that is hosting the data system crashes, right? And this would be a simple thing as like someone tripping over the power cord. Uh, this could be uh, like the, 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 the DRAM goes, goes bad, right? So for this, we're going to have what's called a fail stop assumption. And we're going to say for this type of failure that the, the non volatile storage components that we're actually writing things out to disk for, for our, our, our database, we're going to assume that when we have a hardware crash like this, that they're not going to be corrupted. That we can always come back and everything will be in the correct state we expect it to be. Right? There won't be a sector that gets, gets, uh, gets, gets gar gar uh, garbled up. So this obviously is not always a correct assumption. And you know, this is what sort of RAID and other error checking code things uh, help us uh, automatically figure out for us. But for our purposes, from the database perspective, we don't, we're, not, we're not worried about this. Somebody else will take care of this for us. And the last one is storage media failure. And so this is when the, the actual storage device itself gets corrupted, gets, gets totally uh, messed up. And we end up just losing data. We can't use it at all. Right? So this happens all the time. You can have bad sectors on your disk. Or even SSD, you can burn out the cells because you wrote them to them too many times. Right? So no database system is going to be able to recover from this because this is actual, this is something in the physical world that software can't rectify, right? If, again, if I light my machine on fire or light my, my hard drive on fire, no database software is going to magically make that thing come back, right? So we can get around this through using stable storage by replicating or having redundant copies of the data we want to be persistent so we can overcome this issue, right? And so by database wants to be stored by an archive version, that essentially that means like coming back from a, from a backup copy that you have because you can't recover anything from the disk. So as I showed in my uh, example in the beginning, I, and for this entire class, we've been talking about disk-oriented databases. So this is where the primary storage location of the database is assumed to be on disk. And any time you want to read or write data, we have to get the pages out of the disk and put it into our bufferable manager. Right? And we do this because the, the, the DRAM and non-volatile storage, or sorry, DRAM and volatile memory is much faster than disks, and that's the only place we actually can do direct writes at, at, sort of at a fine grain. So again, as I showed in my, in my example in the beginning, we, get, we, we know what pages we want to access, we copy them to memory, apply our changes, and then at some later point, we want to write those changes back out to disk so that we can recover them after a crash. So, the reason why we want to do this, as I said, is that we want to guarantee that any transactions that a transaction, any changes that a transaction makes and, and, and is able to commit is then persisted after any restart or crash. And we also want to ensure that all our, our transactions are atomic and we don't want any partial changes uh, from uncommitted transactions to show up after a restart. So in all the, the failure scenarios, the first two types, so the, the, the the, the hardware software failure and then the, the logical failure it's going to have inside the data system, we want to make these guarantees. For the uh, media, storage media failure, this is something that's beyond our scope, what we can handle here. So the underlying primitives that we're going to use to make this all work, to be able to make these two guarantees, that all transactions are durable, if we, say that, if we, if we know they're committed, and that we have no partial changes, the two key primitives we'll have are undo and redo information. So they sound exactly like, like, like you know, as, as they state, right? So undo is the information that's going to allow us to remove the effects of incomplete or uncommitted aborted transactions. So it's going to be enough information to say, here's what the old value used to be, and here's how to actually restore it. And that way you, you undo the change that a transaction made. Redo, again, sounds like, just like it is. It's the information you need to reapply a change that a transaction made to the database. Okay, so we're going to use these basic two primitives to now build up 
a recovery mechanism that we would use at runtime to store this information out to disk in some way so that if we crash and come back, we have enough information to be able to make our guarantees that all transactions are atomic, durable, and the database returns as consistent. Okay? So now, which of these two ones you actually use will depend on the, how the data system is going to manage dirty pages in your buffer pool. So let's go back to our example. So now we have uh, two transactions. T1 is going to do a read on A, write on A. T2 is going to read, read on B, write on B. So again, the very beginning, our buffer pool is empty. T1 starts, wants to do a read on A. We go out the disk and get, get that one page that has all our data. And we bring that to memory, we can read it. Now we're going to do a uh, write on A, and then we just go update directly in memory. Now we have context switch. T2 starts. It does a read on B. Our page is already there in memory, so we don't have to go fetch it. We're done. And then it's going to do a write on B and applies the change directly in memory. Now we go to commit the T2. So the question we have to first ask, ask ourselves is, in order to say this transaction has committed to the outside world, in order to make the guarantee that all the changes are durable, do we have to force its changes that are in the buffer pool on the dirty pages out the disk? Who says yes? For this example. It should be obvious, right? Yes, right? What's the problem? Again, this is an entire page, right? We make changes. We, when we write things out to non-fault storage, we're writing things out in, in a page, you know, a page granularity. So what happens if I write this page out? What comes along with I made a change to B1. I want to get that out the disk. But what's what's the problem? Yeah, A's in here. A got modified by T1, but it's going to get written out. So the question is, do we allow the data system to write out the changes made by T1 on A? Because at this point, T1 is not committed. Then, say we, say, say we go ahead and do that. All right? Now we, we, we tell the outside world T2 is committed. That's fine. But now we come over here, and now T1 ends up aborting. Right? So now we need to roll back T1. What do we need to do? We've got to go out the disk, find out, you know, first of all, we've got to know that whatever T1 wrote to, in this page actually made it out the disk. Then we got to figure out where the hell it is on disk and bring it back in and, and reverse that change. Right? So there's two aspects of this. So the first issue was here. Am I, do I have to force all the pages modified by a transaction when it commits out the disk? The second issue is, am I allowed to write pages that have changes from uncommitted transactions out the disk? So these are going to be called the steal and force policies of our buffer pool manager. So the steal policy says whether the database system is allowed uncommitted transactions to write out pages uh, out to disk with dirty records even though they have not committed yet. Because you're essentially, the, the, the database is on disk, the current version that's on, on uh, ignoring other transactions that came before me, whatever pages are on disk are the currently the current versions from previously committed transactions. Now my T1 shows up, and he modified one of those pages. Am I allowed to overwrite the last committed version of the record with uncommitted data? Right? This is what the steal policy is. Essentially, the way, another way to think about this is, I'm running out of space in my buffer pool manager, and I need, to, I need to evict pages to make room for new pages I need to bring in. Am I allowed to steal pages from another transaction or uncommitted transaction to go put those things out the disk and then bring in the ones that I need. So steel says you're allowed to do this. No steel says you're not. The next policy is called force. So force policy says whether the data system is required to flush out to disk all the pages that were modified by a transaction at the moment they commit before we can tell the outside world your transaction is safely committed. So force says that this is, requ this is required. You're enforcing this. All dirty pages modified by transaction will be flushed out the disk. No force says this is not, not required. So let's look at now the, 
uh, and so you choose one. Uh, you choose either steal no steal or force no force. Uh, you have to like those. You choose one from the first category and choose one from the second category. So let's look at no steal force. So no steal says I'm not allowed to write out dirty pages from uncommitted transactions, and force says I have to write out pages dirty pages from transactions when they commit. So T1 starts, does a read on A, we fetch into memory, that's fine. T, T1 then does a write on A, we modify that in memory, that's fine. Then we have a context switch, we read B in T2, that's fine. Now we write B in T2, that's fine. And then we go ahead and commit. So force means at this point that when I, when the, I get the commit message, T2 has to have all its dirty pages written out the disk before we can tell the outside world that we've committed. But with no steal, we say that we are not allowed to write out uncommitted changes, uh, transactions, we are not, not allowed to write out changes made by uncommitted transactions. So how would we have to handle this? Well, you'd have to then maintain some internal information to say, all right, well, T1 modified A, and it's uncommitted. T2 modified B, and we're trying to commit that. So let me actually just only write out the change to B out the disk. That gets flushed, then, our, then we can tell the outside world that our transaction is safely committed. Then when this guy later is abort, this is super easy to roll this back now because I know there's nothing out on disk that, that this transaction modified. So I don't need to touch anything on disk. I just update, I just reverse the change in memory in the buffer pool. And that's really fast to do because it's in memory. So who thinks this is a good idea or a bad idea? All right, I already, said, I, already said give, I already gave the advantage of it, right? Rolling back is super easy because I just you know, reverse the things in memory. What's one obvious bad side with this? He says you have to track every tuple. True, I'm thinking something even worse. He says you need to write multiple times. True, also, I'm thinking something even worse than that. So what does no steal say? No steal says I'm not allowed to write out pages from uh, to disk from uncommitted transactions. So ignoring two transactions, let's say there's one transaction, and I have a database of a billion tuples, but I can only keep one million tuples in memory. Would that work here? No, right? Because because I would update the first million, then I say fuck, I need the next one, right? But I can't go write out my other ones, right? Because the no steal policy says I can't do that, right? So this is super easy to implement, as I said, because you just you know yeah you have to update, up track every single tuple. That's not a big deal. Uh, yeah, you end up doing more writes potentially. That's you know ignoring that. But I can't actually you know I can't take every possible database I, I'd want and be able to modify every single tuple that I want, right? And again, the whole idea of a disk oriented database, the one of the big selling points is that we want to be able to manage databases that are larger than the amount of memory that are, is available to my, my machine to make it appear as if it has enough memory, right? So easy to implement because we never have to undo changes on, on an aborted transaction because no, nothing ever got written out the disk, right? And we never have to redo changes either because when I, if I crash here, right? Say I, before I get to the abort, say the system just crashes. I come back, this is, this is the only information that I have. I just have my change to B. All of this gets blown away because it's in memory. So I come back immediately and don't have to do any extra work to put me back into a correct state. So this makes recovery super easy as well. But as I said, the downside is that the, you, can't, um, you can't actually uh, you know, exceed the amount of memory that's available to you. So let's look at now one possible implementation of no steel force uh, that can sort of overcome this. And again, we'll see, some, we'll see the deficiencies of this, and then we'll see what the write-ahead logging is the approach that everyone actually uses. So shadow paging, the basic idea is that uh, we're going to maintain two separate copies of the database. Um, there'll be the master copy and the shadow copy. So the master copy will be the current consistent uh, snapshot. I, don't, I shouldn't use the word snapshot. The concert, current consistent database state on disk. And then the shadow copy will be where we're going to stage updates to this. So it, rather than overwriting uh, 
the original pages that we have in our master copy, we'll make a copy of them and in the shadow area and then right there. So then what happens is that we'll have a pointer that says here's, you know, here's whether, here's the current location of the master copy. And so I stage all my changes to the, the shadow. And then when I go ahead and commit, I just I flip the pointer to now point to the shadow, and that becomes the new master. And now all my changes that I have for my transaction immediately become, become visible. So again, so this is an this is the implementation of no steal and force. So again, the way we're gonna actually main, organize this internally is that the, the, the page directory is going to be this tree structure. And the, what the tree structure is going to allow us to do is that we can do path copying to say, here's the portion of the tree that's been modified, and here's the portion of the tree that hasn't been modified. And as needed, I know how to route transactions to the right location based on what they're doing. So again, at a high level, it looks like this. So we have some database root, right? And then we have our master page table, and then this just points to p the pages out on disk. And then again, there's a the you know sort of thing. This is all the so the buffer pool manager. We can swap these pages in and out as as needed. And then anytime I want to find a page, I first if I'm if I'm an updating transaction, I would do I would look for the shadow copy. But if I'm just doing a read only transaction, then I can just follow the database route and, and find the right page that I need. So to install the updates, as I said, what's going to happen is all we need to do is, is swap that pointer to now point to the, the shadow copy. And the advantage of this versus maintaining a bunch of information to say, here's all the pages that, that I modified, and now they become the master version. The reason why we do it this way is because we can do an atomic write on the database root because that'll just be in a single page. So I only have to update one location. If I had to, say, apply all the changes to the various pages that I made in the shadow copy, I can't do that atomically because the database system is not, uh, sort of the, 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 the storage device can't do atomic writes uh, beyond a, a single page. So let's look at an example. All right, so say this is the current state of the database. Right, we're pointing, we only have the master page table at this point. So our transaction comes along T1, and it'll immediately create a shadow page table. And at this point here, the shadow page table does not have any, nothing's modified yet. So all of the entries are still pointing to the original pages in the, the master page table. And now if I now do an update, uh, then I'm going to apply all my changes to, through the shadow page table, and any read-only transactions can just go read the master page table. And we talked about this before, uh, having a, a snapshot isolation. You sort of think of the same thing, right? I have a consistent snapshot of the database, up here, but then down here is where I'm staging all the modifications for transactions that have not committed yet. Right? So as I go along, as I update these pages, I'll make a copy of them, and then I just update the, the shadow page table to now point to them. And then at some point, my transaction is going to want to commit. And again, if I had to atomically apply all these updates of these pointers into the master page table, that would be hard to do because that, that's going to span a single page, and it, the, dis, the file system or the disk can't actually do that atomically. But because all I need to do is just update the root, then now all of my changes become visible, this thing becomes the, the new master, and any transaction that comes behind me can, can see all my writes immediately. So I'm ignoring anything about uh, the Concurrentio protocol, so you still have to do uh, you know, two-phase locking or timestamp ordering or OCC. All that still applies here. Right? This is just how you're actually going to organize the, the storage of the, of, of the data so that you can recover it after a crash. So what do you have to do in this case? How do we recover from a crash on this one? Do we have to do anything? Shake his head no. Right. Because if I crash and come back, say I'm here. If I, if I crash at this point, before I commit, the transaction in T1, all its changes are in the shadow page table. They should, you know, the transaction died before it actually committed. So nothing that it wrote should actually still be, be seen after a restart. So if I come back, my database root is pointing to the master page table. I don't have any you know, staged updates in there. I'm, I'm correct when I come right back. I'm in the correct state. So I don't have the, the recovery is super easy, because all I do is just throw this away. Right? And then even after I apply the changes, when this becomes a new master, same thing. I don't care about anything over here. This thing's consistent, and I'm, I'm you know, immediately correct. So what's one, what's, what's one additional problem we have with this we have to deal with? 
So we talked about this last class with multiversioning. So he says, if you have concurrent transactions, do they use same same shadow page table? Yes. So that's what I was saying before. So if you have multiple transactions coming in here, right? They, they may be doing multiple updates to different things. We still need two-phase locking. We still need a concurrent protocol to make sure that those things are ordered correctly. And then what you basically, the way this would work is that you have to stop executing transactions at some point and say, all right, this is my batch. Everybody has to commit, and then we apply it, and then we apply our change. Of course, now the issue there is you have one transaction that's going to run for an hour, and you're kind of screwed because that guy might run forever, right? And then you don't apply any other changes. Yes? So, so based on your description, it seems like the transactions are committed in the batch. So, are you asking? Sorry, yes. The transactions will. So, in my example here, it's one transaction. And so when he commits, I just flip the pointer. If you have multiple transactions, then you have to, you have to, you have to apply them in a batch. And again, so that means that you have to stop executing new transactions at some point, wait till everybody commits at a barrier, and then you apply all your changes. So, so if one of the running transactions aborts, it will affect the other transactions? So he says if a, one of the running transactions aborts, it will affect the other running transactions. So again, so that would be like, uh, you'd have to maintain, maintain undo information in memory to roll back their changes. And that's what we saw with like two-phase locking or, uh, or time-safe ordering. That's all sort of orthogonal to this. Again, we're worried about, we're worried about recovery here, not atomicity for concurrency control or isolation. So if I crash before I flip my pointer, I'm, I come back and my master page table is perfect. Yes. And in the first two commits. Yes. And then the third one, let's say the third one is the last one running. Yes. So if the third one commits, you will spoon a pointer and you got a new copy of the page table. Yes. But if the third one crashes, you don't spoon a pointer, so it is still pointing at the original one. Yes. It seems like the first two didn't commit. They didn't commit, but you didn't tell the outside world they committed. That's what I mean by a batch, right? So only when I swing the pointer, do I say whatever transactions were being staged in my shadow page table, you now tell the outside world they committed. Okay. So you don't have any partial updates. Some transaction could, could, uh, could say I'm committed, but uh, you can't see it. Yeah, the databases won't tell you you've actually committed yet. You'll stall and wait. So the issue we have to deal with now, of course, is garbage collection, right? Because now we have this master page table. We want to throw all that away and maybe reuse it. And then we have these holes here in our, in our heap file from pages that are no longer accessible from, from the, sh the current master that you can't get there anymore. And so obviously we, we want to be able to reuse them. So as I said, supporting recovery is super easy with this because to do undo, all we have to do is just uh, throw away the shadow pages and leave the master page table uh, alone and it will come back in a correct state. Again, this is recovery. This is after a crash. It's not while transactions are still running in memory. And we don't need any redo information because there's nothing to redo because all our changes have made it out to, to disk. The downside, though, is that copying this page table can be expensive. Right? You can use path copying for, to sort of speed things up. Um, but you know, it's, it's extra work you have to do, whereas with, in right head logging, we're not going to have to do this. Um, the commit overhead is actually very large as well. So we're going to have to flush every single page uh, out to disk in order to know that it's, that it's durable. Um, we have to stall transactions if we're doing them in batches until, the actual, until everyone finishes. The other big issue is that the data is going to get fragmented. And this is one of the big issues that the IBM guys saw. So, this is what, so shadow paging is what IBM implemented in System R first in 1970s. This is how they did crash recovery. And then they, they turned out it was a bad idea, and they threw it all away when they did DB2 in the 1980s. And one of the big issues was they were having fragmented data. And so before, back here, say I was doing a sequential scan, and this was a, on a clustered index, I could just rip through that real quickly, and everything's going to be in the correct order. But now as I start making updates, right, as I blow away these other guys, you know, the, the first page is here, the second page is there, third, fourth, right, things are getting out now all, all out of order.
This is sort of similar to what Postgres does. Postgres doesn't do shadow paging, but they do the pen only multi versioning. And that's why they can't support clustered indexes because they're always appending new tuples and not, you can't sort them on, on this page based on the index. So I want to make one correction from what I said uh, earlier in the semester. This was on the first class when we talked about uh, concurrency control, the, the, the introduction to it. I said that SQLite was actually making a complete copy of the, of the, the database file every single time a transaction started. Turns out I was incorrect, and some random dude on the internet corrected me, which is nice. Uh, he was cool about it. And the, what, what SQLite actually does, and I misread the documentation, what SQLite actually does is they make this uh, journal file, and they copy the pages, sorry, they copy the old versions of the pages into this journal file, and then, the, then they overwrite the original version. And the idea there, if you crash before you commit, you'd come back and say, here's the journal that tells me how to reverse those changes. So it's sort of like the opposite of, of like shadow paging. Instead of making copies and then over, making separate copies that you then modify, you make a copy of what the old version is, and then you modify the original version. So just to be clear, SQLite doesn't do this by default anymore. We're going to show right ahead logging next, and that's actually what they do, because that's actually superior to this. Uh, as far as I know, there's only one or two systems that actually still do shadow paging. It's LMDB and uh, I think Couch, Couchbase or CouchDB does this. I don't. I actually don't know if they still do. I know LMDB does this. So again, so this dude, this dude. This is what I love about the internet, right? I'd put this shit on YouTube, and like some random dude in his basement in India, that I've never met, I will never meet. He just say, "Hell, you're wrong." Here's the, here's the line in the documentation to say where it actually really does it, right? That's awesome. I, I enjoy that. All right, so. The other issue we're going to have with shadow paging is that our these flushing operations are going to be expensive because we're essentially doing a bunch of random writes, right? We have a bunch of random pages, and as I showed before, we run through the garbage collection on after we've swapped the pointer in shadow paging, and now we have a bunch of other pages we want to be able to reuse that, that that those locations for the next shadow table that comes along. So now what happens is you have all your pages are just completely uh, randomized in your heap file on dist. So now every time you want to go commit a transaction, you're doing a, uh, an f-sync or a flush at all these different random spots. And as we said, the, the non-volatile storage, like SSDs and spinning disk hard drives, sequential access is much faster than random access. So that's sort of the shadow paging is the worst case scenario because it's, it's random access to do the writes out the disk to make, sure, make things are durable. So we're going to want to actually come up with a better approach where we, we can convert all of these random writes into sequential writes. And this is what write-ahead logging is going to do for us. So the basic idea is that with write-ahead logging is that we're going to write to a log file the changes that a transaction can make to objects in our database before we make make, write the updates to the objects. Now at the very beginning, everything's going to be in memory. So the, the, that's going to be fast, but when we actually now go write things out to disk, we want to make sure that any log, any, if we want to write a page out to disk that contains a mod modification from, uh, from a transaction, we want to make sure that the, the corresponding log record that, that created that change is written out to disk first. And now we have this nice decoupling where the when a transaction commits, we don't have to write all its, its changes out from its dirty pages out to disk. We just, we just have to flush out the log. And the log is going to contain enough information for us to be able to recover if there's ever a crash, to, to reapply the changes we made to the pages. So this is an implementation of, the, of a buffer pool manager with a steel no force policy. So again, the steel policy is going to say that we're allowed to write out dirty pages to disk before transactions committed if we write out the log records for those pages first. And then no force says that we don't require all the dirty pages to be written to disk when a transaction commits. The only thing we have to force out is actually the log records. Again, because the log is going to contain enough information for us to be able to recover those changes. So what's going to happen is, while a transaction is running, it's going to create these log records, and it's going to stage them into a log buffer. And the log buffer is usually going to be backed by a buffer pool. And then at some point, uh, and these log records are, are going to be um, written out to non-volatile storage, 
before we're allowed to overwrite the pages out on disk uh, that, that were modified for the transaction. And the transaction will not be considered fully committed until all its log records, including a commit record that we're going to maintain for it, is actually written out the disk. So transaction starts. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to append a begin record in our Red Hat log in memory that just says, hey, there's a transaction started, and here's this ID. Then when a transaction finishes, we write a commit record that says, hey, transaction T1, it committed. And then we can flush that out. And then we, because the log is going to be sequential, every commit rec every, sorry, every log record in between the begin and commit has to be written out before we can, we can write the commit record. And again, once that's all on disk, then a transaction is considered fully committed. And we can acknowledge to the application that, that we're done. So each of these log records for all the updates, uh, or inserts, update, deletes, are going to contain some additional, all the metadata we're going to need to be able to, to replay, re, reapply the change. So we'll have a transaction ID, again, a unique identifier to say, here's, here's what the transaction change that it made. We'll have an object ID, right, whether it's the tuple ID or primary key or the, the page ID, whatever you want, doesn't matter. It allows you to uniquely identify what object is being modified. And then we'll have a before value, which we need for undo. And then we'll have the after value, which you need for redo. Because again, what will happen is, because now we're disconnecting how pages are written to disk and while log records are written to disk, other than the fact that the log record that modified a page has to be written before the, the page itself can be written, we don't know when we come back, when we replay the log, whether the page that the log record modified made it out the disk or not before the crash. So that's why we have to have both undo and redo. So let's look at our example. So now we only have one transaction, write on A, write on B. So now in memory, we're going to have our buffer pool, and then we have our, our log buffer, the right ahead log. And again, the, the right ahead log is just always going to be, you're pending to the end of it, you're right, you're always, it's always growing in size. So T1 starts, and we have to now add a begin record to our right ahead log. Then does a write on A, and the first thing we're going to do is add a log record to the right ahead log that says there's transaction T1, it's modifying object A, and the old value was 1 here in the buffer pool, and the new value we want to write to it is, is 8. Once that's been appended to our right ahead log, we can go ahead and make the change now in memory down there. Right? And the reason why we want to do this is because we, we'll talk about this next class, but we're going to actually end generating an internal ID called a log sequence number that's going to tell us the order that we're making uh, appending these log records. So down in the, in, in the page in the buffer pool, we want to keep track of what's the last log sequence number that modified this page. And that way we know that we will know that whether the log record that made, made this change has been written out to disk or not. Again, we'll cover this, we'll cover this in more detail next class. Then I do the write on B, same thing, a panel log record uh, says transaction T1, modify B, old value is 5, new value is 9. Then I do my commit. And now in the commit here, I'll do an fsync, I'll do a flush to take the log buffer, and I know at what point in my log buffer all the changes I've, I've made for this transaction have been written out, or wh wh where, where, it's, uh, where its last entry is, because I added a commit record. And then I write that out to disk. And then now at this point, the, because we know we've, we've f-synced or flushed the log record for this transaction, all the logs for this transaction have been written safely to disk. We can tell the outside world that our transaction has committed. Right? If a later point, we now crash, before we actually write out the, the buffer pool, the, the, the dirty page in the buffer pool, we're fine. Because everything we need to, to redo that transaction is now safely in our log record, or log out on disk. So we, we'll cover this in the next class. We can essentially come back, replay the log, and then reapply all those changes. And then now everything is durable. Pretty straightforward, right? So again, the advantage we're getting out of this is that no longer, are, is, in order to write out the dirty pages, I no longer have to do random I.O. to write these things out to different locations. Because now I can do a sequential write on, on the log, flush that out, and that's going to go much faster. The other thing to point out, too, is because the, the, the log buffer is usually going to be backed by the buffer pool manager, the 
the bufferable manager can decide, oh, I need to save space because I want I have other transactions and I want to I I want to be able to reuse memory for new log records. There's nothing about the protocol that says you can't actually flush out the log at this point here before we actually commit. So this at this point here, we could write the log record, the, the three log records for this transaction out the disk and then, then trim the log and start reusing it for other stuff. Right? Because think about it, when I come back after a crash, what am I missing? The commit record, right? So there's no, you know, that's the marker that says this transaction, yes, it is actually committed. So if I come back here and, and uh, after a crash and I only have this in my log, I know I don't want to have any changes made by, uh, made, made by this transaction. And this is why, again, you have the undo information because I don't know whether before I crash whether this page actually got written out in the disk or not. So if I need to reverse this transaction because it doesn't commit it, then I have the original values that I can put back in place. Or if I have the commit record, then I have the redo values to put, put everything back in place. So I have both. I can do both ways. All right? Okay. So just to recap what we talked about. So when should the data center write out log records to disk? Again, when a transaction commits. Right? You have to guarantee that all your log records for that transaction have been flushed out. Right, done, done in F-Sync. You have to wait for the disk controller to say, this thing has been safely written out to disk. Right? Now, F-Sync can be slow, because right? you're, essentially you're block, blocking your thread, blocking your process until the OS comes back and says, your, your, your data has been successfully written. So the way you overcome this or amortize the cost of doing F-Sync is what is called group commit. You basically batch together a bunch of transactions uh, that want to commit all around the same time, and then you do a single F-Sync on all those things. And now again, you're doing a bunch of writes, you're doing a, a, a lot of writes all at once, and that makes things go faster because for a single F-Sync call, you're running out more data than having every transaction do F-Sync on its own. So for project four, you're going to end up having to implement F-Sync, uh, or sorry, group commit. And the way you essentially do it is either you say when the log buffer gets too full, then you flush it out, or, the, uh, or there's a timeout and say, I haven't seen any more changes in the last five milliseconds, so whatever, whatever is in my buffer, I'll write it out now. And essentially, you maintain two buffers. You have one for the stage, all your writes, and you have the one that you're actually actively flushing. Then after you flush the second one, it becomes the place you stage the writes, and then you flush out the first one. And you swap them back and forth. So when should the data system actually write out all the dirty records to disk? So you could do this any single time you, you update a, a tuple or update a page, but that's going to be too slow. Um, you could do it whenever you actually write out that you know, when a transaction commits. That could also be potentially too slow. It actually depends, right? Different systems do different things, but because we're doing this first part here, it's decoupled from when we actually have to write the data at the disk. So we could have a background writer to write out dirty pages and just flip them from being dirty to clean inside a buffer manager, and then some later point we could evict them uh, later on. It doesn't matter. Everything we have on disk in our log is enough to us to replay the transaction. So this, when we actually do this, could depend on the implementation of the system, could depend on what the application needs. It doesn't matter. From like the, the, the from the the basic of understanding the right-hand lo logging protocol. So another way to think about why this is so great is to think about what happens if we actually defer the updates to, to pages. So if we prevented a database system from actually writing out uh, dirty records to disk, like if this is the, the, the no steal policy, if we actually don't let it flush out any dirty data, then we actually don't need to restore any of the, uh, the original values, so we don't need any undo information. So we can just remove that entirely from our log records and only have redo. The, the downside, though, is that if you have different scenarios like this, so the first transaction, T1, it runs, and then it commits successfully, then we crash. This guy starts running, and then, and then it crashes before it commits. So for this one, all we need to do is just uh, replay the log and reply all our changes. The second one is that we ignore all the changes when we come back after a crash, because we know none of our dirty pages have been written. Right? The downside, again, as I'm just stressed this a point we talked about before, this won't work for us if we need to update 
a, a, a segment of the database that's larger than the amount of memory that, that's available to us. Right? So you can't do no steal uh, with right hand logging because you're, you, 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 you need to be able to, you know, um, you can't do no steal without maintaining also the undo information because you can't guarantee that pages are going to be written out the disk, uh, won't be written out the disk until the transaction actually commits. So nobody actually do, does this. And this is why anybody that does right hand logging, you're going to have to use the steal policy. So another way to, to sort of differentiate between uh, these different policies with shadow paging and, 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 and right head logging is in, in terms of their runtime performance for the system and the time it takes to actually recover the system after a crash. So if you're doing uh, no force steal, that ends, ends up being the fastest implementation of a buffer pool management policy for recovery because I can flush out uh, log records sequentially. That's going to go really fast. I don't have to maintain, um, sorry, no force steal. Yeah, this is really fast because you write out log records. Uh, you, can, you can have database, you can have your working set of the transaction exceed the amount of memory that's available to you. Uh, and you're decoupling the redhead log updates versus uh, the, the flushing versus the page flushing. No steal force is actually going to be the slowest because you have to make sure you flush all the pages that were modified by a transaction when they actually commit. And that's going to be random I.O. to different locations to different pages. In the case of for recovery performance, no steal force shadow paging is actually the fastest because I don't have to do anything after a crash. I come back and the, and the database root pointer is pointing to the master page table. I don't see any, any partial updates from uncommitted transactions. I don't have to do anything. So it's, I immediately come back and I'm consistent. I'm correct. In the case of right ahead logging, it actually is going to be slower because now I got to come back and use the log to figure out what the hell was going on when I crashed and put, put me back in the correct state. I have to essentially replay the log. So most database systems uh, will choose this this approach, the redhead logging, because they want to be faster at runtime. Yes, I, I know it, does, it sucks if I have to crash and it takes me a long time to recover, but it's not like your system is going to crash every minute all the time, right? If you do, you have other problems. So most systems make the trade-off of having a faster runtime in exchange for a slower recovery time. Now, there's ways we, we can we can make this go better with checkpoints. We'll see in a second, um, but again. Everyone makes, everyone, every database system makes, makes this trade-off and always chooses this, almost every system. So another way to think about this is that for this one here, you're doing no undo and no redo because you come back and everything's correct. This one you have to do undo and redo because you have to come back and resolve what, what, what is on disk, what was on disk at the time you crashed and put you back in the correct state. So the write-ahead log, the contents of a log record, what I showed before, is essentially, you know, sort of at a high level, almost like I want to call the term value log. That's essentially what we were doing. We had an object in our database. We didn't say what it was, whether it was a, you know, a tuple, an attribute, whatever. And then we had the, the, the original value and the new value, the before value and the after value. In a real system, though, you know, you're updating tuples. And tuples may have, you know, 100 attributes. So, what do, you actually, what do you actually want to store in your log record to say, here's the change I made to a particular tuple? So the, if you want to store exactly the modifications that were made, then you're doing what is called physical logging. And that's basically saying, you know, within this tuple, here are the exact changes I made to all its attributes. Right? Here's the before value and the after value. You can think of this like a, almost like storing a diff. Right? The, the dumbest thing you can do is always, you just, just copy the entire tuple Right, the old tuple and the new tuple, but nobody does that because it's too expensive. So everyone does essentially what is what is called a diff. But it's a low-level change you're making to the physical bits or bytes for the object that was modified. So what's one downside of that, that approach? Again, always think of extreme examples. I have a table with a billion tuples. I update, I update one billion of them. How many log records do I need? One billion, right. So an alternative is to do what's called logical logging, where you store the high-level information about the operation that, that, that was applied to the database that made the change. 
So using my example of updating a billion tuples, say that was a single update statement that did that, right? Update, you know, update table set value, you know, equal value plus one with no where clause. It updates, updates, updates everything. So with logical logging, what I can do instead, have a, instead of storing all the single updates to every single tuple that I have to do in physical logging, I can instead store the uh, just the, the query itself. Because that's enough information from when, when I replay the, the log after a crash to put me back in the correct state. Because I'm, I'm just this is what I did before, and this is what I'm going to do it again. The logical logging requires less data to be written out to the log record than physical logging, which is nice. Um, the problem with logical logging is that it's actually difficult to implement a correct recovery algorithm from this because there's a lot of uh, randomness or non-determinism in the in the system that we now have to account for our log record so that we, if we replay the log after a crash, we end up in the exact same state that we had before. So all the concurrent protocols we talked about before are considered non-deterministic concurrent protocols. Meaning, if I replay the exact same sequence of transactions multiple times, I may end up with a different database state. It'll still be serializable if I'm running with serializable isolation level, but you know, T1 might get scheduled before T2, or T2 might come before T1. And depending on how I'm interleaving those operations, some update query might appear before another one. Or if I'm running at a lower isolation level, then I may be allowed to read something from, from a transaction that hasn't uh, committed yet or just committed, and I don't have any of that information with logical logging because it's just saying, here's the query that executed before this one. But they might actually be executing at the same time, and you might have, you know, uh, it might see half the pages that were modified with this other, other query the first time you replay the log, but maybe not the second time you replay it. Because it depends on some weird race condition inside of the OS, inside of the hardware, inside, inside of the database system. So with logical logging, it's hard to implement this uh, and have the database always return correctly in the same state every single time when you use something like two-phase locking or uh, timestamp ordering OCC concurrency control. Because again, this is non-deterministic. If you do the, the, the partition paste locking or timestamp ordering that we talked about in both EB, they actually can do logical logging because they're always executing transactions in serial order. Right? There's no other transaction running at the same time at any partition. So they don't have this problem. But MySQL, your Postgres, all your other systems, they do have this problem. So one way to get around this is to do what's called physiological logging, um, where instead of storing the individual tuples that get modified, like you do in physical logging, or the low-level attributes, you can just store the all the log records that target a single page together. And you don't specify how the page is actually being organized. You just say, hey, there's some tuple one, two, three inside of this. Here's the changes I made to its attributes. I don't care where in that page one, you know, tuple one, two, three is. You'll figure it out for me. So this is actually the most popular approach because you have this nice decoupling of how the data actually existed on disk the first time you ran from the second time you ran. And you don't end up with uh, you know, incorrect interleavings based on the race conditions of how transactions are replayed. Yes? He says, how do you undo if you're doing logical logging? Uh, so for in-memory database, it's easy, because like, nothing's written as a disk. But we'll ignore that. So both DBs are in-memory database, so they don't have this problem. Uh, for right, So he brings up a good point. If, if it's on disk, uh, depending on what the SQL query is, it would be hard, possibly hard to do. Like, if you have like a random function in there, then that screws things up. For most things, actually, you can reverse it pretty easily. Update table set value equal value plus one. The reverse of that is value equals values minus one. So you just undo that, reverse that. Um, for other things, it's harder. He says you have to says the, the the make logical undo work. You'd have to rewrite the query to to reverse the change that it did when you ran it the first time. Correct. Yes. And I'm saying for most queries you can do that. As far as I'm thinking off the top of my head, I think yes. Uh, 
if there's a random value in there, then that becomes problematic. Um, yes? And then other things, like let's say we have uh, 10 transactions on the log, and uh, since the flush of the pages is kind of a to the DBMS discretion, you don't really know uh, how, how many pages are flushed to the, to the disk. Wait, what, 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 when you say, so you say, so he said, when you do a flush of the disk, you have a bunch of log records, and you say, the log records are on disk, okay, yes. And the people, the actual data, they may be, they may be in the bubble pool, or they may be flushed to the disk. Correct. Through the DBMS discussion. Yes. And like, when you're doing review, how do you know, like, which part is already flushed, and which part is not flushed? Okay, so what he said is, Say my transaction has committed, and I flush out the log records. But now I have my pages in 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 memory that were modified by that transaction. Before I crash, I may or may not have written those pages out to disk. Yeah. So now I come back, and I need to decide whether I needed to redo or undo. Right? It's, it's, it's the same thing. Do, do, yeah, you need to figure out whether, what's the right thing to do to put it back into the correct state. Yeah. We'll cover that next class, right? You basically can figure out uh, some some bookkeeping you do to say, all right, well, uh, actually, the way you actually to, to cheat, I'm jumping ahead. You basically redo everything, right? And for, this is why you can do this with physio physiological logging and, lo and physical logging because. I don't care what was there before, I'm just redoing, I'm just applying the change now, right? Logical logging gets really tricky to do this. So I'm saying nobody actually does this, nobody does logical logging as far as I know on a disk-based system. It only shows up when in in-memory systems that have deter deterministic scheduling algorithms for concurrent control like VoltDB. Because they know the order of things ahead of time. He says, when you're like doing a redo, it's like doing a blind write. Yes. I don't know what was there. I'm just going to overwrite it with, a, with, a, with what I know it should be. Then, we'll see this next class, you do all the redos, and then you go back and undo. It's some, up to the point where you know a transaction did not commit successfully. So you, you essentially do, actually do three passes over the log to, do, to, make, this, to make physical logging, physiological logging work with write-ahead logging. Okay, we'll, co we'll cover that all next class. Okay, so again, the physiological logging is the most common approach. Let's just look at an example of what these three logging schemes look like. So physical logging would be, I have a low level diff about all the changes that I made. Right, so I'm actually storing inside of my page, here's the offset of the, the value I wanna store. Right, I know exactly the layout of the data on that page, uh, should be how, how exactly I expect, and just do my write directly into this. Logical logging is, is just saying I just stored the, uh, the, the query, and that's all I need to do to, to replay it. And undo it, you, just, you could reverse it. And then physiological logging is, it looks a lot like physical logging, but now instead of saying like the offset, I'm saying the object ID. So there's some object has this ID inside my page. I don't know where it is, but here's the changes I want to make to its attributes. And you can sort of think of this as when we talk about slotted paging, right? Slotted pages. I don't care where in my, what slot the object I want to modify is in my page. I can reorder that any way I want, and I have that indirection layer for the slot array to tell me where to go find it. So we'd use this object ID, look in the slot array, and say, show me the slot where object one is, and then that's the diff that I'll, I'll then apply. So uh, we didn't talk about index logging, uh, but you essentially have to do the same thing now also if you're, if, when, when you have the table as indexes, because you want to be able to modify them and, and have them written out the disk as well, because they're, they're going to be backed by a buffer pool manager just like the table heap. So you have to store, in addition to all the changes you make, you want to store the changes to the, to the, to the pages for the indexes, and those need to be flushed out as well. Okay? So what's one problem with, with write-ahead logging? We said it was great, right? You turn all your rights to, to, to turn random rights into sequential rights. It has enough informa information for you to recover after a crash. But how do you recover after a crash? What do you do? You replay the log. 
How far back do you go in the log? You don't know, right? So say my database is running for one year. I come back, do I want to replay the log for one year? I have to, right, because I don't know. I, don't, I may not know what's actually been written out to disk, because there's nothing in the write-ahead log that says this dirty page made it out or not. The other thing I also point out, too, is this is actually the fastest, because it's just, you're just blindly writing into the into pages. This is the second fastest. I have a little indirection I have to deal with, but it's still not that bad. This is actually going to be slow if these update queries take a long time to run. So the way to think about this, say this one query took an hour to run. When I come back, I can rip through maybe the, the log that, that replays its changes at a low level on the actual pages themselves. Maybe that takes me five minutes to go do. But if my query took an hour to run the first time, it's going to take me an hour to run the second time. So if my log is essentially growing forever, then if I have a one year of logical logs, it's going to take me one year to replay this, potentially. So the way to overcome this is called checkpoints. So a checkpoint is basically going to be a marker we're going to put in our write ahead log to tell, you know, tell ourselves all pages that were modified by transactions that, have com that were committed up to this point have been written out to disk. Okay? So then when you come back, all you have to do is figure out when the last checkpoint was and then just replay the log after that checkpoint. I'm being a bit hand wavy about this because that's what I'm saying is not entirely correct because we'll cover this more next class. But I just want to give you an idea of what this is actually going to look like. And then I'll set us up for, uh, for Wednesday to see how we actually do checkpoints correctly without having to stop the world when we take one. So we're going to write our checkpoints out to, to, uh, you know, out to disk, just like the log. And then uh, any unmodified, all unmodified blocks get flushed out. We don't have to evict them from our buffer pool. We just have to make sure that they've actually been written out and we can mark them as clean. And then we have this log entry in, that says we did it, took a checkpoint, and that gets flushed out to the log too. So let's look at an example here. Right? So we have, this is our log record. We have three transactions, T1, T2, T3. So at down here, we're going to crash, right? So we want to figure out what were all the transactions that were running at the moment that we took a checkpoint. So for this one, we're going to do, say, a, um, we're going to do a really simple checkpoint mechanism where we stop everything. We stop all transactions from modifying any pages, doing any updates, running any queries, whenever we take the checkpoint. And we only return now to execution when we know all the dirty pages have been flushed. So at this point here, we got to figure out what was going on in the system at the moment that we took a checkpoint, and we can use that to figure out what has actually been, been written out to disk or not. Right? So any transaction that's been committed before the checkpoint has been, uh, has been safely flushed. So this arrow should actually point to here. So T1 committed before the checkpoint. So all the T1's changes we know are out on disk. So we don't have to do anything with that. T3 and, and T2 uh, started before the checkpoint. So we got to figure out whether we actually should, should be committed or not. So in the case of T2, we know that we're going to have to redo it because after the checkpoint, we see a commit record. And then this thing got successfully flushed because this, you know, this is what we're seeing on disk after, after a crash. So we see T2's commit record on disk. So we know, all right, we got to go bring that guy uh, and, and reapply to all his changes. But for T3, we don't see the commit record before the crash. So we know that we need to undo anything that, it, that, it cha that any changes that it made uh, because they shouldn't be out on the pages we wrote out to, to the checkpoint file. I shouldn't say checkpoint file. We're just, we're just overwriting. We're writing our pages in the, to the main primary storage on disk that we normally would. It's not like we have a snapshot that we're putting on the side somewhere else. We're flushing all our dirty pages into memory or out of memory into disk. So in this example, like I said, it's really simplistic because we're stalling all transactions while we take the checkpoint. Right? And the reason why we, we do this is because we make sure that, you know, say, because the checkpoint is essentially doing a sequential scan on the pages that are in memory and writing them out one by one. So this ensures that 
there isn't a case where a transaction may be actively updating pages at the same time we're scanning it, and we only see some of those updates and not another. And that's another good example of why logical logging is difficult to do, because if I'm just recording the update query, and it's updating every single tuple, and I take my checkpoint, I don't know, if they're running at the same time, I don't know at what point the checkpoint wrote the changes for that, for that update query, and maybe got some of them but not the others. All right? So the, the other issue we have too also now is, in this case here, we basically have to go back in time above the log and figure out, well, what are all the transactions that were running at the, at the time I took the checkpoint? And then that way I know whether I need to look for stuff I need to undo later on, right? So I could have had T3 made a bunch of changes, right? And then an hour later I took a checkpoint. I gotta go back up and look at the last hour to say well, what, what transactions were, could, could actively be running at the time I took the checkpoint. Now we'll overcome this next class because we'll actually store in our checkpoint. Here's all the transaction IDs that were running at the same time I was. So we'll know what, what else is out there to help us figure out how far we have to go back in time in the log to figure out what, what we want to undo or redo. But for our simple example here, we don't have that. Another issue we're going to have too is how often should we take a checkpoint? And so there's no magical uh, formula you can give to say how often you should do this, right? It depends on how comfortable the application may be with a longer recovery time. So the way you think about this, if I'm taking a checkpoint once a day, then if I crash, I know I need to replay at least the log for one day. But if I'm taking a checkpoint every minute, then I can replay the log from the last minute, or last minute or so, and that, then I'll recover, recover right away. But of course now taking a checkpoint is not free, because now I'm writing out pages to disk, uh, and that's incurring disk I.O. to take the checkpoint, that I could be using to be you know, flushing out uh, log records, reading pages in and pages out for, for the regular transactions. So there's this trade-off of, again, the recovery time versus, versus the runtime performance. If I'm okay with a longer recovery time, I can, go, I can run really, really fast. Hell, I, I can just turn off checkpoints entirely, right? If, if, if my recovery time is going to take a year, I can, probably, I can run really, really fast. But most people probably aren't okay with that. So the, most systems actually implement two policies. Uh, you either just have a timeout and just say, every five minutes take a checkpoint. Or you have one that says, if I've, if I've added this amount, of, this, this amount of, of data to my log on disk, go ahead and take a checkpoint. Like if I've written out 100 megabytes of a log, uh, then that's a good time to take a checkpoint. I think the second approach is better. Uh, different systems do different things. And actually, th this is basically what I just said, right? How often you actually want to do this will affect your performance, right? And there's, again, depends on the application. Okay? All right, so this is, again, so this was all the things you have to do at runtime, right? We have to maintain a log or maintain shadow paging. We can ignore that because nobody actually does that. We need to maintain our log, and our log is going to have undo and redo information. And uh, the, that information could either be at the physical level, like the low-level bits at different offsets, or it could be at a physiological level and say, this record inside this page, make, make, you know, here's the changes for that. And then the checkpoints we use to be, able to be able to truncate the log to a certain extent and only have to replay what comes after the checkpoint to put us back to the correct state. All right, any questions? So another way to think about this, every, we've been talking about crashing here, or like you know, unexpected crashes. This is sort of essentially what the data system does when you do a clean shutdown. So when you do a clean shutdown, the data system is essentially doing flushing the log of any actual transactions and flushing out any dirty pages. Right? So that's why, again, if you're running MySQL or Postgres or whatever data, your favorite data system on your, on your own laptop, your own system, you always want to do a clean shutdown. You don't actually just want to you know, do a kill dash nine. Because then you have to do recovery when, when we come back. Okay? All right. So next class is probably the worst class. Uh, I say this because it's like, um, it's not that kids are crying in it, but like it's hard, right? Uh, Aries is the, the gold standard of how to do database recovery. It covers all possible corner cases you can imagine, all the different possible failures, except for, again, the machine catches on fire. We don't care about that. Uh, but it's, it's going to be really, really hard to understand. So this is the hardest class. Oh, sorry, the next lecture is the hardest one. Uh, 
But this is, you know, this is the most important thing because we never want to lose data. This is why you never want to, you know, have your own application and start doing logging recovery on its own because it's going to be really hard to get this right. And Ares is the as a technique or method developed by IBM DB2 in the 1990s that almost every single database system that does Red Hat logging will do some variant of this. So we'll go through all possible scenarios and describe exactly what we need to do to make this run efficiently and run correctly. Okay. All right, guys. Uh, see you on Wednesday. <laughs> That's my favorite all-time. Oh, no. <laughs> what is it? Yes, it's the SD Cricket I D E S. I make a mess unless I can do it like a geo. Ice cube with the G to the E to the T. -O. Now here it comes, dude. I play the game where there's no rules. Homies on the cut, so y'all a fool cause I drink fruit. Put the bus a cap on the eyes, bro. Bushwick on the go with a blow to the eyes. Here I come, Willie D, that's me. Rolling with Fifth Watt, South Park, and South Central G. And St. Eyes when I party. By the 12 pack case of a boy. Six pack 48 gets the real pounce. I drink fruit, but yo, I drink it by the 12 ounce. They say Bill makes you fat. But St. Eyes is straight, so it really don't matter. <laughs>